Management of Congestive Heart Failure by Christina Vanderplum. My name is Christina Vanderplum. I'm the director of the Ventricular Assist Device Program at Boston Children's Hospital. And today I'm going to speak about heart failure in children focusing on management strategies. In our first section, we discuss the pathophysiology and diagnosis of heart failure. And in this subsequent session, we're going to discuss management of congestive heart failure. When thinking about the management of heart failure, we first must consider what are the goals of our therapeutic intervention. And following this, we'll then look into the components of therapy, be it either surgical or catheter-based therapies, pharmacological and non-pharmacological therapies, and then we will focus on preventing morbidity or complications related to heart failure, specifically intracardiac thrombus, arrhythmias, and nutritional and growth deficiencies. Let's begin with the goals of therapeutic intervention. The goal of therapy for heart failure include relieving symptoms of heart failure, such as congestion and low cardiac output, decreasing morbidity, such as those related to intracardiac thrombi and arrhythmia, and including the risk of hospitalization itself, to slow or even potentially reverse the progression of heart failure, to improve patient survival, and importantly, improve patient's quality of life. Next, we move on to the components of therapy. Management of heart failure depends firstly on the etiology and pathophysiology of heart failure. This was further described in our first section, but broadly consists of pump dysfunction, volume overload, or pressure overload. Many children presenting in heart failure may have a combination of these types of dysfunction, be it either pump dysfunction with volume or pressure overload, or one of these in isolation. We must also consider the severity of heart failure. We can classify severity using a multitude of different classification systems, including New York Heart Association classification, which has been most widely described in use in adults, the Ross classification, which is most commonly used in children, as well as staging of heart failure from stage A to D, with stage A consisting of those patients with no symptoms and otherwise normal cardiac function but who may be at risk of cardiac dysfunction, and stage D, those with end-stage heart failure refractory to maximal medical management. Another consideration of management therapies in children is how do they present with their symptoms. For patients who present with symptomatic heart failure, treatment must also be focused at what type of symptoms they present with, be it either congestion or low perfusion or a combination of both. The ideal patient is that person who presents well perfused with no evidence of congestion and ultimately no treatment is warranted at that time. This is in converse to patients who may present with good perfusion, however with evidence of congestion, be it either pulmonary edema, peripheral edema, or ascites. And these patients may benefit from non-pharmacological therapy such as fluid restriction or pharmacological therapy such as intravenous or oral diuretics. There are also those patients who present with evidence of low perfusion secondary to poor cardiac output. They may also present with signs or symptoms of congestion or no congestion. And in the setting of a patient being cold and dry, they may benefit from fluid resuscitation plus or minus the addition of inotropic intravenous medications. And then there are those patients who present with evidence of poor perfusion as well as evidence of congestion. And these patients may benefit from fluid restriction, diuretic therapy, as well as inotropic medication. As you can see, the treatment strategies for heart failure can be very varied, and one must always consider not only the pathophysiology or the severity, but the symptoms that we are trying to target. In addition to heart failure therapy, we must also try to identify and correct all non-cardiac factors that may be contributing to cardiac dysfunction or poor perfusion. These include sepsis or active infection, metabolic derangement such as acidosis, anemia that may be impairing oxygen delivery to end organs, and renal failure. Renal failure and heart failure are two significant problems that sometimes require very different treatment strategies. While heart failure requires low systemic arterial pressures and lower volumes, renal failure unfortunately requires the opposite with higher systemic arterial pressures and more volume. As such, this can be a significant challenge to the treating physician. Also, we must consider any surgical or catheter-based therapies that may correct either volume loading or pressure loading anatomical defects. Let's move on to pharmacological heart failure therapies. These therapies are used in pa patients with either pump dysfunction, otherwise known as systolic dysfunction, with a goal to improve function and or stabilize or relieve symptoms of poor output. It can also be used for patients with poor ventricular relaxation, otherwise known as diastolic dysfunction, with the goal to improve pump 
compliant and relieve symptoms of congestion. And lastly, it can be used in patients with normal pump function in the setting of symptoms of congestion. Most data on heart failure medications has come from studies in adult patients with only very small trials conducted in children. This is due to the fact that we are unable to conduct large trials in children because the prevalence of heart failure in children is relatively low as compared to our adults. Additionally, there are many different causes of heart failure in children, resulting in significant heterogeneity for large studies. Let's begin with drugs for mild to moderate heart failure, stages B and C. There is a large armamentarium of medications that can be used for symptomatic heart failure in the setting of poor ventricular function or congestion. These include diuretics, with the goal to reduce filling pressures and reduce symptoms of congestion, digoxin, to increase inotropy or contraction of the ventricle, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors to reduce afterload and decrease the LV workload, beta blockers to reduce the maladaptive sympathetic activation of the heart to reduce heart rate and allow for more diastolic filling time, and lastly pulmonary vasodilators that decrease pulmonary vascular resistance and decrease the workload of the right ventricle. Let's begin with diuretics. Diuretics decrease preload by promoting naturesis and relieve symptoms of volume overload, be it either pulmonary or peripheral edema. They are generally used in children with stage C and D heart failure. This is symptomatic heart failure secondary to ventricular dysfunction or end-stage heart failure refractory to other medical managements. There are multiple different classes of diuretics, and these include loop diuretics that inhibit sodium and chloride reabsorption in the thick ascending loop of Henle. These include furosemide, bumetanide, and torosemide. Next are thiazide diuretics that inhibit reabsorption of sodium and chloride in the convoluted tubules of the kidney. These include chlorothiazide, hydrochlorothiazide, and metallazone. And lastly, aldosterone antagonists that decrease sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion in the collecting ducts of the kidney, including spironolactone and aplerinone. These medications are used in conjunction with loop and thiazide diuretics, and they have been shown to reduce mortality and morbidity in patients with heart failure, in addition to standard medications. Let's move on to digoxin. Digoxin has a positive inotropic effect mediated by the sodium-potassium ATPase pump and increases intracellular calcium. Intracellular calcium is imperative to increase the squeeze or the contraction of the ventricle. Additionally, it has a negative chronotropic effect that slows the atrial conduction and vagotonic properties that counter the symp sympathetic upregulation, which is maladaptive for heart failure. This ultimately decreases heart rate and allows for more time for the ventricle to fill. It's generally used in infants and children with stage C heart failure for symptomatic relief. Benefits of digoxin can be actually seen at much lower doses than traditionally thought, with trough levels of only 0.5 to 1 nanogram per ml, resulting in a lower risk of adverse effects such as arrhythmias. Next are renin-angiotensin-aldosterone inhibition. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is a very active system in heart failure. It leads to increased sympathetic tone, which is a compensatory for low cardiac output in the short term, but becomes maladaptive over time, resulting in tachycardia, fluid retention, and hypertension. Inhibition of this system are target medications for heart failure, and these include angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, otherwise known as ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs. Angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors inhibit formulation of angiotensin II, which is a potent vasoconstrictor that promotes myocyte hypertrophy and fibrosis. ACE inhibitors improve survival in adults with symptomatic heart failure in clinical trials and reduce the rate of progression of heart failure. However, there are limited small studies in ACE use in children. Experts suggest that use of ACE inhibitors in children with pump dysfunction, such as those with stage B or C heart failure, may be of benefit. However, close monitoring of blood pressure and renal function is imperative as ACE inhibitors will decrease patients' blood pressure and this may adversely affect already tenuous renal function. Enalapril, which has twice daily dosing, is traditionally used for larger children, and Captopril, which has three times daily dosing, is used for smaller infants and children. The next medication is angiotensin receptor blockers, otherwise known as ARBs. 
There is limited data on the effectiveness for use in children. However, there are smaller case studies demonstrating its use as an alternative to ACE inhibitors when there are significant side effects or intolerance of ACE inhibition due to ACE-induced cough or angioedema. Beta blockers. Beta blockers counteract the maladaptive effects of chronic sympathetic activation. In adults, they improve survival, reverse LV remodeling, and decrease myocardial fibrosis. It should be noted that they should only be added once stable on other heart failure medications, including ACE inhibitors and diuretics. Carvedilol is generally the recommended beta blocker for use in children with LV dysfunction, and dosing of carvedilol can be started very low, generally at one-eighth of the eventual target dose, at 0.05 mg per kilo per dose twice daily, and increased cautiously every two weeks to minimize side effects. Side effects of beta blockers include dizziness, fatigue, hypotension, bradycardia, and hypoglycemia. Pulmonary vasodilators. Pulmonary vasodilators are used in the setting of right-sided heart failure secondary to elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. Pulmonary vascular resistance may be increased due to a multitude of different reasons, including abnormalities of the pulmonary vasculature, such as idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, or secondary to left heart failure, with subsequent elevated left-sided pressures resulting in secondary pulmonary hypertension. Phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, sildenafil, is the most commonly used, and this has been associated with improved LV function, functional capacity, and quality of life in adults. There are to date limited large studies in children, however there are a multitude of small studies demonstrating its usefulness in a multitude of different congenital anatomies, including Fontan circulation. Let's move on to drugs for advanced heart failure, namely heart failure stage D. These include inotropes, which are used for acute exacerbations of heart failure with the goal to increase cardiac output by contraction and heart rate response. Catecholamines are the most frequently used to improve myocardial contractility. Generally, we prefer the use of dopamine in combination with milrinone for decompensated heart failure due to the fact that it not only improves myocardial contractility and relaxation, but it also reduces peripheral vascular resistance, resulting in a decreased workload for the left ventricle. Milrinone is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor. It increases contractility, reduces afterload, and has no significant increase in myocardial oxygen consumption. All of these features make it very attractive for chronic use in children who are awaiting transplantation. Infusions of milrinone can, be, can commence at 0.25 micrograms per kilo per minute, up to 1 microgram per kilo per minute. Additionally, this medication has been shown to be effective and safe in an outpatient setting. Let's move on to non-pharmacological therapies for heart failure, which are as equally important as pharmacological therapies. Nutrition. Growth failure, feeding intolerance, and anorexia is a common complication as well as presenting symptom of children with heart failure. Increasing caloric intake by fortification with diet is generally necessary in all children with significant symptomatic heart failure. Additionally, the use of tube feeds via nasogastric, nasojejunal, or direct surgical gastric tubes may be necessary. Another primary therapeutic intervention is focused at fluid restriction. Fluid restriction should be one of the first steps in non-pharmacological treatment of heart failure with symptoms of congestion. Heart failure may result in maladaptive excessive thirst and water intake, leading to electrolyte derangement such as hyponatremia and symptoms of congestion and edema. Simply by limiting fluid intake to high caloric fluids only and limiting total fluid intake may ameliorate symptoms of congestion dramatically. They may also limit the use of diuretics they may, that may have long-term negative effects on renal function. While there's currently no recommended total fluid intakes for children, general guidelines suggest infants having around 100 cc's per kilo per day, children weights 10 to 30 kilos between 600 to 1 liter per day, and older children and adolescents between 1 to 2 liters per day. For more advanced forms of heart failure, positive pressure ventilation may be necessary. This may be delivered by invasive methods such as intubation or non-invasive such as continuous positive pressure. Positive pressure ventilation alleviates respiratory distress from cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It has also been shown to improve alveolar recruitment, lung compliance, and decrease LV preload as well as afterload. 
And lastly, for patients with end-stage heart failure, refractory to maximal medical management, mechanical circulatory support is an option. There currently are many different forms of mechanical circulatory support that can provide both short and long-term cardio and cardiopulmonary support. For short-term support, these include extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, otherwise known as ECMO, and for long-term support, it includes ventricular assist devices. These can be used as a bridge to transplantation or to stabilize patients with subsequent removal of the mechanical circulatory support with ventricular myocardial recovery. Let's move on to preventing morbidity or complications related to heart failure. There are a multitude of complications that can be related to heart failure. These include thrombi formation. Intracardiac clots can form in the setting of severe RV or LV dysfunction, leading to either pulmonary embolus, cerebral embolic strokes, or any other arterial embolic events. We suggest the use of anticoagulation, be it unfractionated or low molecular heparin, or an oral vitamin K antagonist for severe RV or LV dysfunction. And we suggest the use of an antiplatelet agent such as aspirin in the setting of mild to moderate RV or LV dysfunction. There are currently no clear guidelines on what ejection fraction should be used as the cutoff between the use of anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy. However, many adult studies demonstrate that an LV ejection fraction less than 30% should be treated with anticoagulation to prevent intracardiac thrombi formation. Next is arrhythmias. Decreased ventricular function can lead to ventricular and atrial enlargement that predispose to sustain atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. As can be expected, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias can result in significant hemodynamic compromise and destabilize already marginal patients. As such, medication, ablation, or even implantable cardioverter defibrillators are all recommended depending on the severity of the heart failure and the frequency of arrhythmias. In summary, there are a multitude of approaches to heart failure, and ultimately they all depend on the pathophysiology of the underlying cause of the heart failure as well as the severity of the presentation. In considering patients with heart failure, we must first consider any surgical or based cath correction of structural heart disease that may be resulting or contributing to heart failure. Next, we must focus on therapies that are tailored to the severity of the heart failure. For stage A patients, those are those that are at risk of heart failure but who currently have normal function, no therapy is recommended. For stage B, these are patients who are asymptomatic with abnormal function. Simply an ACE inhibitor may cause regression or remodeling of the ventricle and normalization of function. For stage C, patients with symptomatic heart failure in the setting of abnormal function, there is a large armamentarium of medications recommended, such as ACE inhibitors, aldosterone antagonists, beta blockers, digoxin, and diuretics. Utilization of these therapies must be tailored at what symptoms the patient presents with, be it congestion or low perfusion. And lastly, for stage D, patients presenting with end-stage heart failure, refractory to oral medications, the use of intravenous inotropes, diuretics, ventilation, mechanical circulatory support, and lastly, heart transplant are all warranted. Non-pharmacological therapy is also equally important to pharmacological therapy, including nutritional support and exercise programs. And lastly, we must focus on prevention and treating of complications related to heart failure, both thrombotic events and arrhythmias. Thank you for watching this video on heart failure management in children. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.